Well, here we are another Saturday morning. Ken Salville and Don Burnett sitting here talking to you about gardening. Well, there you go. Another, yeah. As a matter of fact, it's 1806th show. It so is. It's, it's, <laughs> it's getting pretty pretty up there. Uh, we're pushing mm-hmm. for 2,000. Eh? A big shout out to my Auntie Kay, of course. She, I, I hope she's listening this morning. Auntie Kay McLeod, she's, uh, yeah, she's my favorite aunt. <laughs> Absolutely, my mom's sister. On the other hand, we better get started here because we have the tips and plants of the week. You betcha. My tip of the week is... I've said this before, however, I'll say it again. The best investment in the garden is a comfortable, well-placed garden bench. Mm. And you can go out and enjoy the garden. You know, have your favorite beverage, watch somebody play golf on the golf, no, whatever. Plant <laughs> of the week this week is the Campsus radicans, the trumpet vine. Oh, yes. It's, uh, it's blooming all over the place, Ken. And mm-hmm. Not just the uh, regular uh, orangey, what is that color? Is it orange? Uh, it's Not kind more. of a peachy color. Yeah. Peachy, I don't know. Yeah. Mango. But there's the golden one out there, too. I've seen a few golden There's bright ones. yellows and yep. reds and yep. sort of that rusty red and a bunch of different colors. Really cool plant. Good vine. Yep. There you there go. There you go. I also have a tip and a plant this week, and my tip of the week is that the beans are back. They are back, and they're forming bean pods. So that's because the weather has changed, and that means that uh, this last week's of cooler weather is really going to be paying off in the bean patch, mm-hmm. and I'm really looking forward to having some nice fresh pole beans again. We had a good blast of them early on, and then when the heat came on, they just stopped, and now they're back. So it's uh, it's exciting. All right, my plant of the week this week is the Flux David Eye. That's Flux Paniculata David Eye. That is one of the beautiful summer-blooming Fluxes. And uh, this particular one is pure white. It was the perennial plant of the year a few years back. And uh, for good reason. It's powdery mildew resistant and it's deer resistant. And it's just a beautiful plant. Extremely clear white color. It's just the brightest there is in the garden. And blooms through August, which is one of those times it's a little hard to get things to bloom. So that's my tips and plants for this week. Remember to check growercoach.com. Ken, uh, summer flux, mm-hmm. fabulous uh, summer color. I've been looking for summer color, uh, mm. actually taking pictures of things that bloom in the summer, perennials. Uh, of course, annuals, you always get color with annuals. But, yes. Yeah. But the perennial color is so easy to find in the spring, and in the summer, it's a little more difficult. Yeah. There are some yeah, nice... it narrows down. You know, there's probably about 30, 30 to 40 plants that you can rely on, but... But that's not that many, can, considering there are thousands and thousands <laughs> for spring and fall. So, you know, uh, I really do appreciate the plants that bloom through late July and in through August. And then in September, you get a little bit of a crossover. You get some of those late summer bloomers that keep going. And then the fall plants start to kick yeah. in, and they do their thing. All those fall asters and fall sedums. And, you know, there's really really is a, a number of really great fall blooming and plants. fall foliage color, too. Mm-hmm. Change color. We've got an old friend phoning in this morning, and we're going to answer the phone right now and get him on the air. It's Dominic Ramponi. Good morning, Dominic. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you guys doing today? We are well, and mm-hmm. uh, you sound well too. And uh, have you had your your uh, share fair share of cherries today? I only had twelve so far. Oh, that's oh, oh that's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm doing it on behalf of market research. Make sure I know the quality of the cherries. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it, it's it's an it's an exciting time of year, boy. When you see the the customers customers come in and and try the cherries and see the expression on their face and mm-hmm. and start explaining to me explain to them the the scope of the industry. They're they're uh, they're quite a quite amazed. Like our our plant on the highway, there we're capable of sorting thirty six thousand pounds an hour. An hour. <laughs> an hour. I thought it was per day. <laughs> no, it's per hour. Oh my wow. goodness, that's amazing. Yeah, so it's it's quite it's quite exciting though. The 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 che- some varieties of cherries are a little smaller <laughs> because of the heat. Yep. But because of diversity of our location of our orchard. Uh, we've got some very, very good quality uh, cherries, and are quite, uh, quite pleased with the uh, with the quality mm-hmm. of them and the variety of the uh, uh, cherries that we have. So it's an exciting time of year. It's it's 
when you bite into a cherry, you're biting into a, a good portion of Okanagan sunshine. So we're quite happy to be to be uh, part of it. So and our, our retail store, store is now open on Highway 97 at the plant, and of course we got our Dendi Orchard location on Pooley Road. So it's an exciting time of year. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, look at. Uh, are you out there today? Uh, I'm at the Highway 97 location okay. for most of today. Okay. But Perfect. I'll yeah. probably be at the at the Pooley Road one uh, tomorrow at some point in time. Perfect. Well, look at. Uh, we will definitely come and see you at some point, uh, Dominic. We love coming out there and hearing the stories and looking at the orchard and seeing where those darn cherries come from. It's really, really fantastic. And, and the question of the day at the Pooley Road is. What's the second largest island in British Columbia? Okay. You, okay. I, 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 I can, I can, you, I know it right now. Okay. Well, don't say it. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> I wouldn't don't blow your, I wouldn't bag. burst your bubble. <laughs> okay. Thanks thank you, Dominic. Much, guys, and you, and you, thank you for keeping supporting agriculture and this industry is going to grow and we're proud to be part of it. And no awesome. pun intended. It'll grow. The, that's right. That's, take, you're quick. I like you. Yeah, take care, Dominic. <laughs> okay, we love you. Bye. Take care. Bye bye now. Thanks, Dom. Bye. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Dominic, the Ramponi family is uh, like the Casorsos and uh, and the uh, all, all sorts of lots of Italian folks that mm-hmm. were um, uh, were around back in the day and uh, uh, and they're still here. The families are still here, but they they really were uh, early on. Uh, there are lots of French families. That's why mm-hmm. we see Lakim and all the different French names on the streets. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, it's uh, amazing. And then Br- very British. Yeah, a lot of and, farmers. And of now it's very a lot diverse. of farmers. Yeah, yeah. Very diverse now, and, and it's very cool to see that. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, the days are getting shorter, Ken. I hate to tell you, but they are getting shorter. And uh, the days, uh, you know, like today uh, is, uh, I'll tell you how much, it's 50 minutes shorter than the longest day in June. Mm. Almost an hour shorter now than it was in, in, in the 22nd oh. of June. You know that's all right. Uh, I'm 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 enjoying actually waking up in the morning and it's not already sunny out. Oh, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Even though I get up really early, but yeah. I was kind of you know I don't really like that sun coming up at four o'clock in the morning kind of okay. thing. Yeah, it, it's uh, it kind of wakes you up. Messes you up. Yeah. yeah. But anyway, that's the, that's the deal. It, the days are getting shorter, and of course, plants re- respond to that days mm-hmm. getting shorter. By the time we get to uh, you know mid August and that sort of thing. The old chrysanthemums, the garden mums, start getting triggered, mm-hmm. you know, uh, to bloom. Uh, quite, people quite often have asked me, you know, why I have a garden mum that doesn't start blooming till the frost comes, and then it, then it it's it just ruined. blooms, yeah, and then yeah, it and then the frost frozen. Gets it. Yeah. Well, you haven't got a garden mum, mm-hmm. <laughs> or or mm-hmm. you've got a light on constantly coming on lengthening the day right near that garden yeah artificially lengthening the day for sure and it could be one of those florist mums we talked about and they're a little trickier to get to uh to to bloom they're used to actually like pure complete darkness and i think i think you're right on the light thing that's one of the main reasons yeah yeah Two five zero eight six two two five two five for for you to get through to Ken and I today. We're uh, having a, a wonderful time here as we usually do, but I just want to pass something along here. That uh, well, a couple of things. First of all, my former math teacher Lars Pada has passed mm. away, oh. and a lot of people, uh, a lot of folks in in Kelowna would remember Lars. He was a math teacher for several years in the uh, KSS, and uh, I knew him. Then and I knew him all through his work, his retirement, and he got into gardening a little bit and mm-hmm. enjoyed that. And uh, yeah, great guy. And so our sentiments to the to the Pata family go out from the garden show here. Now we've got another gentleman to talk about uh, that's very important as well that has passed away. And I'll keep you uh, sort of in suspicion, uh, in suspense, not suspicion, suspense mm-hmm. until we get back. After these messages, with more and with fifty bucks. Well, we are back. It's a beautiful Saturday morning. Um, I wish I wouldn't be able to say that because I'd like it to be pouring with rain right now. 
just calming down in cats and dogs. That's what I want to see. <laughs> I want to see the forest get dampened. I yeah, want to see our sure. yeah. gardens and our lawns and everything get a little bit of drink. Yes. And uh, yeah. get the uh, reservoirs filled up. And, uh, you know, I mean, yeah, I'd I, like to talk a little bit about that just because um, it's one of these things that it's been so dry that plants, you know, in the past, they've always relied on irrigation here in the valley. Uh, to keep them going, but but there's always been that little bit of a reservoir because we get rain in the winter or snow in the winter. Mm-hmm. And we get a little bit of rain in the spring, and it and it moistens the earth, mm-hmm. and not so much this year. So when we have a a large tree, say a street tree or something or a big tree, its roots spread all over the place, but I don't know where they're going. Because the only place they're going to get water is right out of those sprinklers, you know. So some of the plants are really uh, suffering. really going to be suffering. And you get that uh, leaf scorch, you know, that you we're seeing a lot on the maple trees. And a lot. And like you say, we we need a we don't need just one <laughs> rain spell. We need a week. We need the monsoon. We do. We need a lot of rain. So. And sooner than later. You Look bet. at, uh, Ken, let's tell people about the fact that this valley, prior to the irrigation systems going in, Mm -hmm. reservoirs and things like that, was virtually, unless you're right down by the creeks uh, and the lake and whatnot, was virtually a desert. Uh, There was pines and some native plants, uh, sumacs and native roses and, you know, that kind of thing going on. But it wasn't until... Uh, humans started to develop irrigation systems mm-hmm. that the valley became what it is today, a farm farming community, farmland. Mm-hmm. So without that, it is a desert. And so people have to remember that. And the water that you're using in your garden, just remember, every time you turn a tap on, you're using very expensive, clean, potable water mm-hmm. that takes a lot of money and effort and infrastructure to to give us that beautiful drink of water we need uh the the clean bath water that sort of thing that we use domestically in the house so really really think about your uh watering habits and watering practices ken's talked about it a lot over Mm -hmm. the years and and uh, there are ways to to water and to have a decent garden uh without uh wasting water yeah and you know one of the key factors is uh is when you have to shoot it into the air first before it hits the ground, that adds a, a certain challenge, you know, whether it's in the day or at night, uh, there's a lot of evaporation mm-hmm. that goes on. And the warmer the air is, the quicker it evaporates and the more moisture the air holds. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the issues when you have these uh, hot, these hotter spells and hotter weather is that the, the anything that's out there dries up really quickly and the air itself absorbs all the moisture. So it's very, very dry out there. And, and uh, you know, we, we all have to do our part in, in watering where we need to. I always have a feeling that, you know, that the food crops are number one on the list. There are things that you want to, you know, if you're going to use your, use your water that you're allotted, th- that I think food crops are a, are a worthwhile, um, you know, uh, product mm-hmm. to apply it to rather than just a lawn. Uh, if lawns are drying out, they are drying out in certain areas. Uh, again, if there's any deficiencies in your irrigation system, it will show up. And uh, also, not just your irrigation, but your soil underneath the lawn. And that's one thing I think people forget about is that, you know, those areas, you might have six inches of soil, like the actual topsoil in, in most of the areas of the lawn. But there'll be these thin areas where you, you only have about two inches Mm-hmm. And oh my, that shows up right away. I mean, you start to get those browning spots, and regardless of irrigation. Mm-hmm. Well, and we often said too, say too, I, I, when I drive by and I see somebody's lawn that's uh, a little on the brown side at this time of year, I go, "Well, you're doing your part because uh, that's really what it's all about is to mm-hmm. um, uh, back off on the water." And lawns really can overcome that if they uh, if they you know, if you let them get on the dry side. But we got a very small lawn, and so I don't feel too badly keeping it mm-hmm. in good shape in the backyard. In the front mm-hmm. yard, of course, I've got sin lawn. I don't water it at all. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, I, even though, you know, I'm an avid gardener and uh, horticultural consultant and all that, here I have fake lawn. 
Yeah. But, you know, the fake lawn. It has thing. its purpose, yeah, you know, it and is. if you're, you know, as well, I think the thing with, with artificial turf is that you know that you have to wear shoes to walk on it, especially in the heat of summer. Yeah, it can get it, warm. Yeah. It does get pretty mm-hmm. warm. Yeah, it's not, but, it's really, in my opinion, the it isn't really meant for use. It's meant for looks. Mm-hmm. In our front yard, uh, we don't use the front lawn other than chipping a little bit onto the green and, and do my thing mm-hmm. there. Uh, with 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 the uh, golfing practice, um, that's the only time I use it. Uh, you know, we don't lay on it. We don't. It's just it's there for looking, and you know, it it looks neat, and tidy, and uh, relatively weed free. We we let a few weeds grow to make mm-hmm. it look, <laughs> look <Yeah>. natural, <laughs> and then um, yep. you know, I've even had young folks come by in the fall, knocking on the door, wondering if our lawn needs aeration. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, uh, have a closer look uh, and uh, see see what you think. Anyway, that's uh, that's it. But it is very very important uh, to be cognizant of the fact that we are water shy, especially this year. It's pretty shy. Mm-hmm. It's it's a very uh, commodity that's very important to us. You know, Lake Mead, uh, hopefully, is not. Um, Drying so, up? <laughs> well, it's drying up. I'm just saying the, the what's happening to Lake Mead, mm-hmm. the Hoover Dam Lake, um, because they supply all the water to California, to Las Vegas, to all you know. They're they're huge. Well, it's it's gone down hundreds of feet, and you p- see pictures of Lake Mead where the where the where the original water level was way up here, and there's all this white uh, white uh, cliffs that uh, indicate where the water was at one time. Mm-hmm. Scary. <laughs> And it's been doing this for a long time. It's not like it just happened this year. This has been over and over and over a long yeah. period of and time. And it hasn't been, hasn't been refilling. It hasn't <laughs> been refilling. That's the problem. No. Yeah. yeah. It's not enough water to keep up. Yeah. But, you know, uh, you know, I hate to say it, but, you know, it's tough to build a giant city out in the middle of a desert where there's no water supply. And then you have to ship all the water from far away. And, know. you know, it's, it's uh, you know, I, I don't know. There is there going to come a day when they're going to have to shut down old Phoenix and lock the doors and yeah. say, we got to move somewhere where there's more water? Phoenix and Vegas and that. Boy, can you because imagine? Because you need water. You have to have water. You it's not just for water. plants. I mean, for sure, plants are secondary. Uh, you need people, water to, yeah. to, to drink. You need water to bathe. You need, you know, you need water. You water is a, a, a very, very important thing. And they now, do a, a fabulous job of, of recycling and collecting. Mm-hmm. And, you know, they yes. do all that stuff. Yeah. And they are really, well, you know, to. cutting edge. Oh, they have, have to. to. Yeah. And Las Vegas is, I think, probably the world's top location for that yeah. uh, management of water mm-hmm. resources. It's it's amazing. Um, we've had the uh, the pleasure of meeting the, the, the people who, who run that oh, wow. part. And, yeah. uh, and actually... Um, they work actually, uh, and they do communicate with the city of Kelowna right here, and they share ideas and and concepts of mm-hmm. how to conserve water. And it's uh, I, I don't think a lot of people know that that uh, Kelowna is pretty connected with some pretty pretty high end people out there, mm-hmm. and uh, that's one of their main c- connections. Ken, I just want before we take this break, I want to talk about George Scotter. George Scotter yeah. just passed away. George. Uh, not everybody knows George, but everybody in the garden community knows George. Yeah. He knows and read his books and whatnot. Yeah. George Scotter uh, and Etta, his wife Etta, beautiful people. They uh, were members of the garden club for many, many years. Mm-hmm. And uh, Etta Scotter was the one that won all the prizes. I just remember, yeah. you know, <laughs> and first prize goes to Etta Scotter. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, <laughs> she just won everything. She was she was really avid, mm-hmm. an avid gardener and, and a very a real supporter of the garden club, not just mm-hmm. a, a, a member that went to. She was a supporter and a yeah. participant in all their activities. And uh, George was right there. Uh, I, you know, he was he was so quiet, such a quiet man. I didn't know how deep a person he was oh, when it came yeah. to horticulture and, and his knowledge and his uh, just an amazing, amazing man. Yeah, an uh, author of several books. Yeah. yeah. Amazing. Uh, the latest one, I think, is The Wildflowers of the Rocky Mountains. And I have mm-hmm. that book. Uh, you have it as well. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's a wonderful book. Uh, mm-hmm. And it's well written. And the photography is done by someone else. But his he does all the writing. Mm-hmm. Uh, did all the writing. Amazing. So we just want to send our condolences and and, and uh, thoughts out to the Scotter family, mm-hmm. um, Etta, and uh, their their 
children and relatives and all the people that are mourning his death. We will be, I will be going to the service this morning, uh, to George's service. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's a big one. There. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, in one week I've, I've lost a math teacher and lost a great horticultural friend. Mm-hmm. Great, just like that. Yeah. Sad. Very sad. We're going to take a short break. Uh, 250-862-2525 is our phone number to get through to Ken and I. Um, nobody on the line right now, but we love to share our time with you, and uh, we mm-hmm. enjoy having you call in and, and, and share your time with us. And uh, we'll do that when we come back with more. Yeah, we'll You betcha. Now, we've got uh, Dan Bruce waiting online here. We're just going to ask Dan to just hang in there for a moment or two because um, we want to talk to Ethel first. She was first up. So, Ethel, good morning. Good morning. I have, uh, I don't know when to uh, pull my garlic. Do I dig it or wait till it dies or what? How well, do I do uh, answer to one question, I don't pull my garlic anymore because sometimes they snap off. So I take a digging fork and carefully uh, far enough away from the garlic that I know I'm not stabbing any of them, and I'll just loosen it, and then they'll come out nicely. Um, you know, if the foliage of your garlic is looking brown, um, it's not growing anymore, you know, and, and the scapes are there and whatnot. It's not doing anything underground anymore. And possibly okay. the chances of it <clears throat> getting some malady down there, like like either a rot or a mm-hmm. worm. Or a Better to yeah start drying them out a bit. Yeah, yeah. So That's, it is oh. time. This is a time when we harvest garlic. Oh great! Yeah, okay. so I would do it. Because well, I went to, I pulled one uh, last. I tried to pull mm-hmm. one last week, and the roots like go down to head. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> so anyhow, I got, I did get the fork like you suggested, and I got it out, and it is beautiful. Yeah. And now the other question I have, yes, they are all drying up. The tops are all Mm -hmm. probably all gone. Mm -hmm. I have a little clump with about, um, oh, gosh, 10, 15 in one little clump, little guys. Mm -hmm. Now, do I break them apart and replant them? Those are like uh, seedlings or? I don't know. um, Did you have garlic last year? Yes, I did, yeah. and the but not as good as this year. And they went to seed, probably, and that's probably what's growing, these little garlic plants. You might want to, you can just leave them. Um, if you're going but, to uh, transplant them, you want to wait till fall to do that. Yes. You could lift mm-hmm. them and, and separate them and put the little tiny bulbs in, in uh, and they'll grow into larger bulbs in the spring. But like, but they're all in one clump, should I not yep. separate? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Oh, yeah. you, you dig them up, mm-hmm. separate them, but don't do it now, do it in the fall. Oh, oh, wait, oh wait till then, yep. Okay. So I can take them out of the the guard that they're the garden the spot that they're in. Mm-hmm. Okay. You bet. But they, they dry. Do they dry out? They, they. The reason I'm saying wait till fall is that they're so small that if you mm-hmm. dug them now and let them dry out, um, they may dry too. They, they might be not as viable. Not as um, I mean, I, if you wanted to, I guess really they're just a bulb, so you could probably lift them now and. And and do just, the transplant now. Just mm-hmm. plant them. Uh, however, mm-hmm. I think fall is better. No, I'll, I'll wait till fall. But yep. I, can, I, can, I got area for them. Sure, not yeah. a problem. There you Perfect. go. Great. Thanks so much. Ethel, Have thanks for calling in. Yeah, we appreciate for it. calling. Okay. Bye bye. Now we got Dan Bruce on the line. Good morning, Dan. Good morning. Uh, before you get going here, we have a, a, a hummingbird question from a caller. Oh. <laughs> yeah, there was a, and, and I recall something that you've done about this in the past, but wasps are an issue around your, your, your uh, feeder. And they come around and they land in the little flowery thing and then they, the, the hummingbirds won't come in because the wasps are there. Is there, did you find something to deter that? Well, I got rid of the little flowery things. <laughs> yeah. Um, I just, um, some of the feeders have a, a very flat um, yellow flower device um, that doesn't stick out at all. <clears throat> mm. Those aren't a problem, but some of the feeders have a very elaborate plastic flower that simply gives the wasp extra places to sort of land on. Mm. Um, also, the hummingbird 
has to insert its head into this flower, which it doesn't like to do. Mm. Um, mm. Somebody didn't do their research. The trick is just <laughs> to get rid of all that plastic yeah. excrescence on the outside of the feeder. There you go. And um, the hummingbirds and the wasps don't get along, but there's not much you can... You, you can't interfere with nature to that extent. No, mm -hmm. no that's true. Depends well, what have you got up your sleeve today, Dan? Well, last week we talked a bit about the Maya and their um, <coughs> efforts, successful efforts to grow chocolate. Mm -hmm. And it would appear that um, that's probably where the cultivation and development of chocolate took place. But it was launched into Europe um, from really from the at the hands of the Aztecs. Mm. Um, <clears throat> the chocolate bean was used in Central America in pre-European times <clears throat> as a currency. Oh. Um, like small change. <laughs> wow. Um, so, yeah, money does grow on trees. There you go. Now, Dan, Dan just be, I know you've got more to say, but I'm just going to ask you, and you may be going to say this anyway, um, what is the process? I mean, let's face it, a chocolate bean, you don't just have, oh, that's lovely, that's chocolate. That doesn't taste like chocolate, right? No, if you um, <clears throat> pick the, the pod off the tree, open it up, um, the beans are inside the pod. They are enclosed in a sort of very sweet-tasting mucus-like, substance mm, which sounds as a delicious. small kid i used to raid the chocolate trees <clears throat> mm -hmm. and break the pods open uh, to get that part of it and the <laughs> yeah um this practice was frowned on um but no there, there's quite a long process you have to um dry the beans r roast them very very carefully get rid of the skin off the outside of them um, then grind them. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's a long-winded procedure. Hmm. Okay. Uh, but so uh, the Mayan uh, people, uh, what did they, they, they develop that process? Yes, they, they understood how to make this. And both the Maya and the Aztec and, and the peoples in between, of course, uh, made chocolate in the form of a... <coughs> Um, not exactly a chocolate bar as we know it, but it was a form of, of candy, mm -hmm. um, a luxury flavored with a number of things, um, including chili pepper. Oh, mm. Well, I can, get, I can get off on that. I, mm. I enjoy, um, yeah. People turn up their nose at that concept, but um, try it before you knock it. No, I actually, <laughs> there, uh, at Buckerfields, they had these little cans... Uh, about yeah. the size of a snuff can, and yeah. uh, they they had these little um, uh, sort of triangles of chocolate inside, and they were they were infused with uh, hot pepper, mm -hmm. and tasty and uh, really really great, and only about so, forty calories per sliver. Um, well, <laughs> who's counting? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm supposed to be. Um, <laughs> so the Aztecs. Um, didn't have a way of um, estimating weight. The concept of scales mm -hmm. uh, was a European thing. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> in order to keep track of, of um, quantities, the Aztecs counted, and they were good at it. Okay. Um, chocolate beans were... Um, made into <coughs> sacks and there were so many sacks in a load and in Mexico City when the uh, when the Spanish first arrived Tenochtitlan the Aztec capital Moctezuma's um, warehouse contained in excess of 40,000 loads of chocolate beans <laughs> and when you count that out, that is something in the 
to the excess of 960 million beans. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> my goodness. Now, is that where the, the term bean counter came from? It might have been. <laughs> um, now, the Aztecs um, certainly <coughs> used it as currency, but they also made it into um, this sort of candy uh, flavored and also um, a drink. Um, Moctezuma himself would have been served cold chocolate as a drink flavored with vanilla mm. and or chili pepper. Mm. The Aztecs called it cacahuatl. Okay. Mm. And um, it was indeed very, very highly regarded. Now, anyone familiar with the Spanish language will understand that the Spanish would get rid of that name very quickly, particularly if it referred to something that was brown. Ah. Caca. Uh, <laughs> gotcha. That's so, uh, very good to relate this stuff and get it all organized. <laughs> um, we are not actually sure where the word chocolate comes from, mm -hmm. but that is how it was um, presented in Europe. And uh, it very quickly was accepted as an elite um, mm. beverage. And the Roman Catholic Church was put in a bit of a quandary. Mm -hmm. Is it is chocolate a drink or is it a food? <laughs> and, of course, the rules and regulations that the Church had in those days regarding fast days and um, mm. so on and so forth, um, the question had to be answered. Is this a drink? which was okay on a fast day, or is it a food which was not okay? Hmm. And I think the answer varied depending on which bishop you talked to. <laughs> right. And, and probably what, that's what created hot chocolate, because that's a drink. Yes. Um, it was accepted in Europe really as a hot drink rather than a cold one. And it took the Europeans some time to figure out the making of like a hard wrapped up chocolate candy bar. Mm. Mm. Well, there you go. So, Dan? <laughs> that's amazing, yeah. Um, do, you have, do, you have a, do you have a climax here? Or? <laughs> <laughs> well, the climax is a, a large unopened... <clears throat> bar of Whitaker's milk chocolate made in New Zealand, mm. available widely in Kelowna. London drugs will satisfy you. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> yes, the, the, the consumption of chocolate is the climax of most people's day. <laughs> and I've, I have said before, quoting somebody else, that... Um, <laughs> Nine out of ten people say they like chocolate. One out of ten people is a liar. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you go, eh? Well, all right, well, thanks, Dan. This is really uh, really interesting. Uh... Um, one thing I should point out, though, mm -hmm. is that <clears throat> if you really want the hot chocolate experience, what you need to get is the, the um, round chocolate cakes um, mm. made in Mexico. Yes. Um, Ibarra and Abuelita. Mm -hmm. um, those will give you the real um, chocolate flavor. If you buy a chocolate powder like um, Hershey's or Fry's or something, that has been pulverized and powdered and the cocoa butter has been taken out, mm. which does change the flavor. Yeah, it's not like the real Once thing. Once you've taken the chocolate, the cocoa butter out, you can't put it back in. Mm. So the Mexicans make this chocolate <clears throat> in a cake form that you melt into the milk and hot water. Mm. And that gives you the full flavor. 
with the addition of vanilla and cinnamon in the, um, in the way that the um, the Aztecs used to drink it. Amazing, wow. yeah, and delicious. Uh, and thanks for introducing that to us. Uh, I think was that the, I guess that was two years ago, Dan, or maybe it was three years ago, and we uh, down at the Farmers Fruit and Produce there, where we you were set up there, and, and yeah, uh, that was that was incredible. And and it seemed like it sold right out <laughs> as soon as that well, happened. Well, um, Farmers Fruit and Produce still have it in stock. So oh, good. Well, there you go. Right on, Dan. Just before we go, because we've got to uh, we've got to take take another break here. Um, I'm not sure whether you knew that George Scotter has passed. Oh, I did not know. Okay. Uh, I've been talking about him on the radio this morning, and uh, his service is this morning at 11 o'clock at the uh, Mormon Church on Glenmore, Glenmore Drive. I will observe a personal yeah. minute of silence in George's honor. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Dan, I knew you'd appreciate knowing. Anyway, we're going to take a break, and thank you, Dan. It's always a pleasure. Well, um, that works two ways. I enjoy doing it. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Well, we'll see you again next week. You will. Take care, buddy. Awesome. Thanks, Dan. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. On that note, we're going to have to take a short break here, uh, and it it will be a a pleasure coming back with more AM 1150 Garden Show. Well, all I talk about chocolates made me hungry, actually. I, mean, <laughs> I, I wouldn't mind a little piece of chocolate right now. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, actually, maybe next week I'll ask Dan this. Um, chocolate. I mean, there's various degrees. Some of it isn't really chocolate at all, is it? I mean, it's uh, fake well, chocolate. It's the world today, right? It's You, you, you have to read the ingredients list. Yeah. You know, and... Uh, Try to avoid that uh, fructose glucose stuff that's yeah. in there, you know. So yeah, some of it's better than others. Yeah, and as he was saying, that uh, mm-hmm. the the real thing, that real Mexican hot chocolate, and you follow the instructions. It tells you exactly how to make it, and you make it exactly the way they tell you, and it's like a completely different drink. But it's oh, it's really really good. Yeah. Interesting, love it. Ken, I've been talking about our trip to the Chelsea Flower Show and the Florida yeah. Expo 2022 next May. Uh, May the 22nd is when we're going. And um, if you're interested in going, definitely give uh, Marlon Travel a call. Just uh, Marlon Travel is in the book as well as uh, I can pass out the number. But the Florida uh, Expo only comes once every 10 years and starts at April 14th. 2022 mm-hmm. and it is the stage for the florida expo 2022 uh, horticultural expo for six months it's on and uh it's all about greening up the world greening up the cities greening up things uh, this year mm-hmm. and and sustainable gardening sustainable so it's quite uh you know a change from over the years uh, but um it really is th- th- the floriade park is there all the time it's mm. it's like it's like the um the exhibition grounds in Vancouver right. and once a year the PNE happens. Exactly. So the Floriad Park is there and it just beefs up, goes on steroids for you know, six months and mm. becomes uh, an event every ten years. So yeah, it's gonna be exciting. We're uh, looking forward to that. And um the other uh, events that we're going to be seeing on the trip, of course, is uh, Kensington Palace. We're going to be seeing uh, Sissington Court Gardens in Kent. And we will see the Chelsea Flower Show, which I have been privileged to see once before. It's an amazing show. It really is an amazing show. And then we take the train up to London, uh, from London uh, to Amsterdam uh, through the Channel. And uh, go f- from there, we uh, go to the, the Floriade uh, Show. And we do an Amsterdam canal cruise, which I've done before, and it really is a neat thing to be taking the cruise in the Am- in the Amsterdam canals. Anyway, it's uh, lots more, of course. Those are the highlights, but uh, it's going to be a good trip. And uh, you can give uh, Marlon Travel a call when you uh, can and see what you can do to get on board with us. Uh, Donna and I are 
hosting it, and uh, we're really looking forward to, to doing this. 250-862-2525. We've got only about five minutes left before we have to, uh, four minutes actually, before we have to take another short break. Mm-hmm. We're here every Saturday morning. This is, as I said before, the 1,806 times that we've done this show since 1983. Uh, yeah. We've enjoyed it very it's much. Fun. We enjoy the callers. Uh, we, we enjoy hearing from mm-hmm. folks, and uh, that's what we do. Just like I've often said, it's just like talking over the back fence, gardening, and s- shooting information back and forth and enjoying mm-hmm. each other's uh, gardening experience. Speaking of which, uh, yeah, what's tomorrow, going on? Yeah. Tomorrow. <laughs> what's going on in Don Burnett's garden? Well, yeah. Now, it, it's a garden club event, okay? Mm-hmm. This is a gar- Kelowna Garden Club event. Mm-hmm. Kelowna Garden Club is one of the oldest garden clubs in the Valley, probably is the oldest garden club in the Valley. And uh, been around a long time, and uh, we uh, every every year the the garden club members, some of them, will open their gardens up for a, for a visit. And last week we were honored to go to three gardens, beautiful gardens in in West Kelowna. And uh, I know last year when I put a presentation on at the garden club, they had suggested uh, we open our garden up. Well, last year it just didn't happen, COVID and all that stuff. Where is this year? Um, we're behaving ourselves and we're now able to do this so we are tomorrow opening our gardens up to the club members now if you know a club member mm-hmm. you can go as their guest accompany them but it's basically a Kelowna garden club thing yeah if you're not a member and you want to be a member just come to the garden tomorrow between 12 and 3 that's uh, 2484 Rhonda Crescent and come to the garden and uh you can uh, join up right there, and then you'll be allowed to stay. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. not that serious, folks. But anyway, it's going to be fun. We're Donna and I are looking forward to it. I've got things uh, looking fairly good, and uh, I've got some posters up showing what the garden looked like earlier on because gardens mm-hmm. evolve and change. They're not the garden is not what it was, um, you know, back in. Uh, uh, well, well in yours, your yep. case has really evolved. It's it's quite something. Yeah, it's, it has. It's okay, we're, yeah. we're going to take Angie before we take the break. Angie, yep. good morning, Angie. Good morning. How do I know when a cantaloupe is ready to be picked? You smell the end, don't you, Ken? Something like that? Yeah, well, there's, yeah, that's the smell of it is, is how a lot of people tell. Yeah, they sniff the, sniff the. You can you can yeah, smell you can it right through the, the yeah. yeah through the whole fruit you can it's, smell it. It smells sweet, mm-hmm. but I think you can pick them sl- like semi ripe, like they do tomatoes, and they'll ripen up. Mm-hmm. They ripen up after they're picked. Yeah, uh, if as long as you bit, yeah. as long as they're semi ripe, as long as they've got some gold showing, they're not just straight green. Mm-hmm. So the gold is from the bottom, like that was sitting on the ground. Uh, well, uh, I'm not too sure about that. All I know is that they, uh, they need to have that little bit of cantaloupe smell when you, when you whiff them, sniff them. And that indicates that they're starting to ripen or they are ripe. And if you, uh, the, the, the more powerful that smell is, that aroma, uh, the more ripe they are. Okay, I will do go. my best. Yeah, kneel down on the garden. I want to see you kneeling down, <laughs> smelling your cantaloupe. <laughs> I might not get up. Yeah, <laughs> that that's, means, that's, I know. That's I know the feeling. Too, yeah. You bet. All right. Angie, Thank we appreciate you so your much. call. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah. Thank bye. you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, uh, mm-hmm. it is a, an age-old question. And, and you know, we when we're buying uh, watermelon, too, you just never know. It's a kind mm. of a crapshoot, isn't it, with watermelon? Yeah, well, you're supposed to tap them yeah, and yeah. listen for the sound. It should sound Follow hollow sound. like my head. Yeah, it should, yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Exactly. And, but, <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes it's really sweet. Sometimes it's not so sweet. Uh, yeah. It's a bit of most, a crapshoot. Most of them are, are good, I find. I, I haven't really come across a... I, I think... I've cro- I come across some pretty bland heavy, watermelon. Yeah. But, but didn't have that nice bite to it, really. Remember sweet. when watermelons used to have seeds in them? Yeah. Can you remember yeah, that? That's right. Weird. Uh, spitting seeds. Yep. And I was told when I was a kid to never eat, the wa- no, don't consume the watermelon seeds because you know what? They'll get into your appendix and cause appendicitis. Oh. 
<laughs> Somebody Googled that, I think. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Where'd that come And from? everything you find on Google is true. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> we're uh, just about ready to take that break, that 9 o'clock break. We're going to come back with a blistering hot show uh, coming up. Uh, and especially with no rain, it is blistering hot. And, uh, mm-hmm. you know, people are really watching their watering uh, out there because we've got to be careful. Um, we, you know, it doesn't get replenished till winter. Winter's a long way off. Oh yeah. We're, we're only yeah. part way through. I know. And, uh, so what we have is what we have. And, uh, even if it rained, it's not going to pour. It's Mind you, it, anything, could, it yeah. could give you some real, we could get some real rain, but there's nothing in the forecast right now in rain. No. There's nothing there. So it is a very important thing. We watch what we do. And I am going to now, we're going to take that break for the news, and we'll be back with more AM 1150 Garden. We are back with you, and uh, I just want to say, uh, you know, I've talked about this for many years now, getting a lathe and a milling machine just for mm-hmm. uh, hanging out in the shop in my old age here. Um uh, because I do enjoy that. I, I'm passionate about a lot of things. Very, very passionate about plants and gardening and that sort of thing. But I love building stuff. And um, ever since I was 14 years old um, in high school, uh, taking metal work um, in high school, uh, it, we um, we made stuff on the lathe and the milling machine and the shaper. And, and we even we even did some aluminum sand casting back then in those days. And just loved every minute of it. I, I really enjoyed my shop time back then. And uh, all these years, I've said, boy, if I could have a ma- lathe and a milling machine, I'd be a happy camper. And over the years, I'm too busy to even think about that. Plus, mm. there's a bit of dough involved. You have to invest some money to, to have a decent lathe and a milling machine. But you finally did I finally it. did it. I, 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 sold my, I sold my Land Cruiser, Ken. And uh, traded it tra- in, for, traded a in for a lathe and a milling machine, and now I have that in my workshop. So my shop is cramped. I mean, I've got <laughs> it's a woodwork, metalwork, uh, uh, machinist, um, and fabricator shop all in one. And, and it's not a real big shop, it's about 22 by 25, 22 by 25, something like that. Hmm. And uh, so I've had to be real organized in there, and um. Uh, so in my playtime, I go from the shop, walk across over to the greenhouse and play in the greenhouse. Then I go back to the shop. <laughs> <laughs> it's like being retired. Yeah. Oh, I'm telling you. Oh, it's so awesome. much fun. So I made my first uh, first little thing on, on, on uh, the lathe and got my practice in burling and threading and, and uh, machining and getting it done. But it, it, it really, there is a learning curve huge learning curve you got to know all sorts of stuff like first of all the tool has to be right centered on that thing that's where the tool how do you take your garden trowel and get it in there and get it sharpened up yeah we, we, i don't know <laughs> i do that on the mill i think we do that on the mill but uh you know it's uh it's there's a learning curve so mm-hmm. i have this uh really nice kit that i've got and i'm going to be making a um a steam engine a replica of an 1880 oh, yeah. steam engine. That's pretty cool. And uh, so I got this kit, and I opened it up, and I go, oh, boy, oh, boy. Uh, this is, uh, and I start, I, I haven't start even thought of starting it. I have to know so much in order to make this thing right, and you only have one kick at the cat. If you make a boo-boo, you've ruined the part, and it's all cast, uh, uh, cast iron. Mm-hmm. It's all cast uh, brass. And, uh, it's, uh, you got to machine this all down into, you know, hundreds, a thousandths of an inch in, uh, in, uh, you know, it's really something mm-hmm. anyway. So that is that, and that is my new machine shop. I'm going to actually start building plants as well. I can do that. Plants? Yeah. Because like I, a I'm a propane gonna, plant. No, I'm going to get a, I'm going to get a lab going and I'm going to do test <laughs> tube plants. Oh, <laughs> hey, tissue culture. Yeah. There you go. I'm all over it. Love it. Cool. Well, there you go. So uh, the, now you're having your garden thing tomorrow yep. and then yep. uh, back house. out into the garden. Open yeah, house. that's yeah. going to well, be pretty cool. And, oh, you, you mentioned beans, Ken. Uh, yeah. I've got beans uh, plants are great. Mine ha- still haven't started coming on yet. 
Uh, oh, they're full okay. of bloom and everything, but they're just not coming to fruition. Yeah. So check that, close, anyway. check close. Like oh. I just checked. That's why it was my tip the the week this week is to look up close. And what what I was seeing was uh, the actual flowers dropping off mm-hmm. the plant. Like they would they would come out and they would bloom, mm-hmm. and then they would just shrivel up and fall off. Mm-hmm. And so I wasn't getting any fruit set. And now all of a sudden I notice little tiny beans about uh, I'd say a centimeter long. No, oh. and there they are. And they're just going to fill up with water, and they're going to be delicious and tasty in about probably 10 days. Yeah. So looking forward to it. Little baby beans. Baby beans. Yeah. You know, they grow into being right. big beans. Remember when you and Wendy were by and I was mm-hmm. eating these figs? We were eating figs? Yeah. I planted a bunch of them in pots, Ken, and I got one coming up. Uh, what, fig, oh, uh, fig oh dates. A date, not figs. Dates. Dates, They were yeah. dates. And so I've got one Shooting out of all up. this. I put seven mm-hmm. date seeds in each pot. One date seed looks has like germinated. a grass. It looks little, like a grass. It's yeah, a monocot like coming yeah. up. It's a pretty monocot. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Oh, I got one growing. So we'll see That's what the happens. Thing, uh, the thing about uh, growing like, tropical seeds is, as soon as like if you're eating something that's got a seed in it, you take it and plant it right away. You don't wait. You put it in the ground. Mm-hmm. Faster mm-hmm. you plant it, faster it grows. Yeah. They don't need that. Uh, they don't like stratifying. Being, yeah, they yeah. don't like being dormant. Or if you mm-hmm. dry them all out and store them for a month, it could take a year for them to mm-hmm. germinate. Mm-hmm. But if you just are eating it, take the seed out, push it into some soil, keep it moist, warm, away it goes. Two five zero eight six two two five two five to get through to Ken and I today. We're uh, here, ready to help you with your gardening questions, and uh, we would like to talk to Pam. Good morning, Pam. Good Hello. Morning. Good morning. Good morning. I am growing edamame beans for the first time this year. And mm-hmm. so far, I think the plants, uh, thankfully, they know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, they are growing just fine. They're starting to bloom, cutest little blooms. Um, just wondering from here on if um, I know I haven't seen the pods yet, and I'm assuming they'll be coming. Mm-hmm. Have either of you grown them, or what can you help me with knowing when to pick them? I, I don't know if I would know. These are mommy beans? Edamame. Edamame. Yeah. Ken, are you familiar with edamame beans? Absolutely, uh, yeah. Soybeans. Oh, soybeans. Soybeans, okay, yeah. There There's a lot of different types, and they do grow here quite well. Um, yeah. You definitely, <laughs> just like just like other uh, vegetable plants that you grow, you sometimes have to try different varieties to get ones that really take off and grow. <laughs> But the ones that, uh, as soon as they start looking like the ones that you buy in the package and you can see the, the beans inside the pods, you see the little yeah. bumps, it's time to start testing. So you try one okay. and actually eat them. And, and you know, and uh, yeah, as soon as they, you know, you've bought the ones that are frozen, you know, I'm sure you yeah. have. They're so delicious. And then you, you just steam them a little bit and a little bit of salt and pepper and a little bit of butter on there and you're good to go. But, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, they're so good. Well, they're even better the ones that you grow at home. They're just better. And uh, but again, uh, like I've tried them several different times, and I and I learned that I had to keep trying different varieties. And so again, researching the variety, especially for us here in the Okanagan, we need to find the 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 ones that are really known to grow in hot climates. You know, that can handle the heat, and that's really the secret. And if you can get a good one. You'll know it because they'll produce that like crazy. Well, I've got, yeah, I, I I got these from a gal who, um, I have four different types of seed. Mm-hmm. She showed me the beans, like the mature seed beans when they're hard. Right. And they're actually different colors. Hmm. Um, there, there's four different names. One of them is um, came from Sunshine Farms. Nice. And I think they've been growing it for a number of years here. And mm-hmm. it, it is interesting when I've, I've planted all four varieties in the same bed, so they have a relatively, I mean, I would think they have as, as consistent a conditions as can be. Same water, same soil, same sun. Yep. And there is quite a difference in how they are growing. Mm-hmm. Um, some are, some didn't like it to begin with, and some are just further ahead. It's, it's, so I, I think I will, there will be a couple that probably emerge as my favorites for my yard conditions. Mm-hmm. Um, and I don't know if the taste matters um, but it'll be interesting, yeah. Yeah, they'll be good. I'm sure they'll be really good. Beautiful. It's a really and then I'll, fun... have to, well, then I'll have to find more room in my uh, already small yard. For <laughs> the problem with expanding varieties is you just you don't always have their space. Yeah, right. yeah. You have to. You have to. Well, you get more creative, don't you? You have to. 
get the old wash tub out, fill it with soil, <laughs> and start gardening. Oh, yeah. Right? I got a few of those for sure. For yeah. Sure. Well, you're doing a good job, Pam. I always enjoy uh, coming to your garden. It's very, very nice. And uh, you've got uh, all sorts of variety there. Um, and, uh, you know, from grapes to, uh, to your, uh, uh, brassicas and things in your, in your planters out front. And, and of course your wonderful, uh, uh, beauty berry, your, uh, mm-hmm. yeah, it's, uh, pretty. yeah, it, it is. I am so enjoying the, um, diversity and I'm so also enjoying the, the, uh, moderating of temperatures because it's a little bit less stressful for mm-hmm. all of us mm-hmm. to try and keep everything alive, but it's still, it's ama- plants are amazingly resilient. It's quite something. Oh, I should just tell you before I go, uh, about oh, maybe six, eight weeks ago, I called about a dahlia that was drowning mm-hmm. because I put it in a really bad choice of a pot. Mm-hmm. Well, it's about to bloom. Oh, good. Um, it has come yes. back just gangbusters and so vibrant. Yeah. I think ultimately I lost maybe three leaves um, <laughs> to the drowning, yeah. um, but it responded really well to resuscitation. And uh, so I just want to encourage people who have, sometimes you just have to say goodbye to a plant, but sometimes, especially if it's a valuable one, it's worth a little bit of measure to try and remediate a problem um, yeah. to bring it back. Absolutely. Don't give up, right? <laughs> that's right. Don't give up. It's not, it's not, it's not over until it's really over. Uh, that's <laughs> that's right. awesome. Yeah. Excellent. Pam, we always love hearing from you. Thank you again for the call. Appreciate the call from the Take show. Care. Right on. Mm-hmm. Thanks Bye-bye. for calling in. Bye-bye. Yeah, that's the thing, you know, and, and the, the soybeans are still uh, is subject to the same sort of issues that some of these other beans are where it gets too hot. They, the blooms just don't set up. Mm-hmm. They just they don't set the fruit. So now with this little cooling trend we're in right now, let's hope it sustains. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of these plants will really kick in and start to produce. Ken, well said, and thank you, Pam, for uh, reminding us of the great soybean because it is a tasty little devil. Isn't it? Mm-hmm. Okay, nice. we're going to take another short break. We invite your calls two five zero eight six two two five two five to get through to us today. Uh, we're here to answer your gardening questions or just discuss your garden, and we appreciate that. We'll be back with more AM 1150 Garden Show. We are back with you on a beautiful Saturday morning. A little bit of smoke coming in the air, but other than that, it's a darn lovely day. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are going back to the phone lines, and we've got Karen joining us. Good morning, Karen. Good morning, fellas. How are you both today? We are 100%. Very good, thanks. Yeah. Excellent. So this year, my son decided he wanted to put his hand to some gardening to distract him from other things he wanted to uh, leave behind. And so I found a couple of raised garden beds, not wood ones, but Mm -hmm. we put them together Mm -hmm. and picked a bunch of plants. I let him go at it as far as getting them all settled in. And then as the tomato plants have grown and some of the others, he realized uh, they're a little closer together than he anticipated. But mm. you know what? Learning curve for him. So with the tomato plants, as they get really bushy, does it still take a while for them to bring the fruit out? Uh, well, it varies depending on the variety. Uh, each variety that's chosen has sort of a days to harvest. So okay. uh, usually it'll say, you know, 60 days or 70 days or 80 or 90 days, depending on that particular plant. And that means, I think, right from seeding, from the date you seed them all the way through till it's fruited. So, yeah, it just it depends on the variety. And if you're seeing some flowering, you know, what follows the flowering is the fruiting. So it should be coming on uh, pretty soon. Yeah, and these were actually plants. We went to the greenery when he was a kid. Uh, I had to make it short and sweet and be planned ahead when I had him with me in the greenery. But the last few years, uh, when he's willingly going in for longer spans, Mm-hmm. If he's wanting to shop, it's really good. That's <laughs> super cool, and yeah. If, with these raised garden beds, uh, can you winter any of the plants over by cutting them back and maybe co- covering them with with the heavy plastic wrap? Well, well certain certain things yeah. uh, you can overwinter. I overwintered my spinach last year, mm-hmm. and I didn't cover it at all. It just came through nicely. So there are certain things that will overwinter. Mm-hmm. Uh, peas, uh, if you plant them in the fall, will sometimes nicely overwinter and then come up in the spring. Yeah, and, and other um, 
often other types of uh, foliage crops and onions actually will will do that as well. So onions you can plant probably right about now. Eh, Don would be a good yeah, time to start yeah. planting some onions. Plant some onion yeah. seeds. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The tomatoes won't. They'll they'll be done when the season's over. But the uh, yeah, these some of these other plants are excellent. And then next year you even get better success because they're already in the ground. Yeah. Okay. So with the tomato plants, it's basically at the end of the season when they're done, just uh, take the plants out and, and compost them. Yeah, well, the tomato plants and that are not going to survive for you, of course, no matter how you... Sorry about that. My dog and my neighbor's dog decided to <laughs> visit. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Well, Karen... Anyway, so you yeah. said the tomato plants, yeah, definitely at the end of the season when they're done, pull them and... Yeah. compost. Compost them. You bet. You bet. Yeah. All right. Okay, that's about all I can think of right at the moment for okay. those questions and with when the uh, with these raised garden beds we have uh, basically for anything uh, like if they're completely empty or very minimal you know, for empty ones can they just be covered over the winter or leave them open? I think I'd leave them open and let the mayor out Karen because uh, you know you start covering them over you might be sheltering some pathogens and things like that you might as well leave them open yeah okay then okay I thank you so much and yeah. hopefully all the smoke will be minimal and yeah. mm. the firefighters can get through all these heavy fires that are going on yeah you for bet. sure we certainly uh, wish them the best of luck you bet yeah okay, okay. Then, thank you so much for everything and have a wonderful weekend you too karen thanks yeah. for the call thanks for Appreciate phoning it. thanks Bye-bye. Bye for now. Bye-bye. 250-862-2525 to get through to Ken and I today. We're talking gardening because that's what we do. And uh, there's a lot of stress going on in the plants this year with the heat mm-hmm. and whatnot. However, um, you know, uh, you can go. My my uh, hostas have come right back after that heat mm-hmm. dome that we had that really took its toll on a lot of things. Things, Friday, have stu- yeah. things have bounced back quite nicely, actually, in yeah. my garden. And they're looking good. Yeah, when you have, uh, you know, some leaves that go brown, they might get burnt uh, by the sun. And now that that is gone, those leaves, if they are, if there's more than like 50% of the leaf burnt or, you know, upwards of maybe 50 to 60% or more, you might as well just snip the leaf off and allow a new leaf to come out because the plants will replace those leaves, uh, you know, if they're damaged bad enough. But there's no point in just leaving them there, <laughs> you know, if they're, especially if it's in a prominent location. So, you know, that's something I've been doing as I go along, uh, getting rid of some of the, the, the leaves that came through that, that uh, extreme drought we had, uh, heat wave, and, uh, yeah, letting some of the new stuff grow back. It's amazing how some plants that were just literally fried are now starting to shoot again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So they're coming back from the dead. This morning I was reading online, uh, Ken, that... Um uh, the uh, lake level in Kelowna, in the Okanagan Lake, is the lowest it's been in 20 years. Oh. Yeah. But it's well below full pool, which uh, it, it didn't reach full pool this year. Mm. So that's what we're talking about. It's a, it's something to be wary of. I don't want to see water rolling down the streets, and and uh, I don't want to see, yeah. you know, it's just uh, not, a, not a good thing, you know, washing your car in the driveway and... <laughs> Stuff like that yeah. with good potable water that's expensive. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your idea of doing, uh, you know, when you do water, you use a, uh, you know, a handheld watering device of some sort on the end of a hose and do spot treatments. Yeah. And that's really the way to go. And just remember that old plants, plants mm-hmm. that have been around forever and ever, mm-hmm. and they're just old plants living on the landscape, they really don't need any water at all, like almost none. Mm-hmm. So, you know, depending on the species. Mm-hmm. Or you give them one really good soaking, you know, once a month or once every two weeks or something. But they don't need a lot of water. And there's indicator plants. I mean, but back mm-hmm. off a little bit on the water, and the ones that are the ones that need the water will indicate. They'll start wilting, you know, like my hydrangea, yeah. like my uh, my false sunflower, and a few others will show, oh, yeah, we need water. Yeah. So that's where you focus on those. Anyway, yeah, we've got Karen back. Before we take a break here, we've got Karen back. You've got another question, Karen? Uh, yeah, first, tomato seeds, like when you get a, a nice ripe tomato and and you're enjoying it, can you take the seeds and 
and use them for starters for next season? Well, you you can. It, most seeds that you, you harvest on a real ripe tomato will grow, but they're not necessarily going to be the same tomato. Like there's cross pollination going on. I've got a, a variety. My uh, my uh, um, Belmonte tomato. I harvest a seed from that every year, and it uh, it comes true to form. But lots of you know, Ken's often explained that how the hybrid situation goes. If you've got a hybrid plant, the seed ne- doesn't necessarily come true to uh, to to what you had. It will grow a plant, and it may grow a nice tomato, but it won't be the same one that you took the seed from generally. Okay, and as far as uh, working with the seeds, as you take some out to save them, do you rinse them off? No, and... what I do is I uh, wait till the tomato's really ripe, okay? Really ripe. And then I can still picture my dad doing this, sitting on a chair with mulching, mushing the seed up, and then he'd spread, the, spread that pulp on newspaper. And uh, each seed... Uh, when when it's all dried up, then he will take a little sharp knife or a razor blade and just l- slip the seeds off that newspaper and put them in a jar for the following spring. Mm-hmm. Okay, okay. There That's you go. New. Works and well. And a few weeks ago, uh, Don, when I had phoned you, I don't know, a month, month and a half mm-hmm. ago, and I was at... Uh, Rona, but I want you uh, trying to remember a particular plant. It's like a morning glory, uh, but it opens at night, and then mm-hmm. uh, uh, That's and deter, I think. she actually googled on the mm-hmm. phone, and uh, and it's moonflower. Yeah, right. And also another one that opens just at night is the uh, one of the, some of the Oenothera. Evening primrose. Uh, e- evening primrose. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, okay. very nice. It's, it's awesome. Okay, I'm thank you, dear. Pre- appreciate the Thanks call. So much. Okay, bye bye now. Have a good one. Yeah, you bye. too. Bye bye. And on that note, we're going to take that short break here at the bottom of the hour and invite your calls two five zero eight six two two five two five to get through to us, and we'll be back with more AM eleven fifty Garden Show. Back with you, and uh, we have joining us Marjorie. Good morning, Marjorie. Good morning, Don and Ken. Hey, Good morning. Good morning. I have a brom. I think it's called bromeliad. Bromeliad, yes. Yes, and it's on gazan. It, it says underneath. It says gazmania. Does that give it this? That another name for that, or what? Uh, could be gazmania. Yeah. It's not gazania. It's J U Z M A N I A. Jasmania. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Um, there's so many bromeliads yeah. uh, out there, and it's probably one of them. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I was just wondering, does it bloom again where the blossom was? From what I understand, they don't. They, oh. The pups that come up at the base yeah. will bloom again. Now, Ken, is that true? Yeah, well, it depends a little bit on the species, but uh, with the bromeliads, they'll generally produce a, a, like a central uh, sort of a vase, and then from that vase, you'll get several blooms that come out, and it takes a long time for them to bloom, and then they bloom and last a long time. Yeah. But when they're all finished, you can still just leave the plant growing as long as it looks you know, reasonably mm-hmm. tidy. But sometimes that central vase will start to die out, and it'll start looking rough, and you'll notice that there's two or three new plants growing from the base. And so once the top part is looking really kind of, you know, like kind of ratty, it's not looking mm-hmm. too good, then you can actually remove that and snip that part out and let the new ones grow up, and they'll shoot up and do the whole thing over again, except instead of just having one, now you've got four or sometimes even five of them. And it's, it's yeah, quite I have a, lots of little pups coming, what they oh, call good. the pups. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it doesn't harm it to just to keep that that one that was blooming nice, but now it's dried up, and it still looks nice. It yeah. Looks like yeah. No, it's just not going to hurt. It no, as long as you can, I would say. Yeah. Think, think of it in nature that you know, in nature, it takes care of itself. So, yeah. you know, nobody would normally cut them out in in, in nature, nature, but yeah. you know, and I, as long as it looks healthy, like the leaf yeah. part, I would just leave them. Yeah, Marjorie, did you know that the pineapple is a bromeliad? 
No. There it is. There you okay. Go. <laughs> so that that's the diversity of plants, of course. And so, yeah. as Ken was saying, it all depends on the species of whether that'll bloom, bloom again. Some of them will. Yeah. But in the case of a pineapple, it doesn't. Uh, the the yeah. pineapple blooms once, forms a pineapple, and then the little pups come so up. I've got a lot of little pups on this, so hopefully well, they will all bloom one day. Yeah. yeah so beautiful. what kind of fertilizer would I give it? A uh, very mild uh, water-soluble fertilizer. Like a 20-20 or yeah, 15, some 30, 15 or something? Either of those is fine, yeah. And just very, just mild, about half strength. Yeah. And then you can uh, actually even put a little bit right in the vase in the middle. Yeah, I, I put water in because it says on the instructions they like to have water in their little wells yes, there. Yes, that's right, mm-hmm. yeah. So yeah. a little bit of, of nutrient in there as well is not bad. It's a good thing, so, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Marjorie. I, yes, thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks for joining yeah. us. Yeah, thanks for calling. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. I betcha. And uh, we're going to uh, go to Addie. Good morning, Addie. Good morning, guys. Good hey. Good morning. How are you? We're 100%, and how mm-hmm. are you guys? Well, we're fine. We're less smoky today than we were yesterday, oh, so good. that's a good thing. Good. Mm-hmm. Um, my trumpet vine is blooming, but... Very sparsely, not many blooms. It's four years old now. What should I have done to get more blooms on it? Well, is it uh, is is this the first year it hasn't bloomed that much, or is this kind of tri- uh, typical of it? Well, this is the first year that it's really bloomed a little more than last year. Every year mm. it's blooming a little bit more, but I thought mm. by four years it should be blooming a lot more than it is. Right. Well, you can do the typical uh, high phosphorus uh, feeding, you know, 15, 30, 15, or if you want to really go nuts, go 10, 52, 10, 10, 60, 10, something high in the middle number. But it's not, go- it's not going to help you this year, <clears throat> but for next okay. year it might. So how soon would you start fertilizing, like just April, May? Yeah, once the weather warms up, Ken's often said it doesn't work well if you fertilize too early because you need the heat for it to work, right? Mm-hmm. And okay, that, yeah. the other thing is my blue spruce, you know, I have the low-growing blue spruce. Mm-hmm. Yes. I just noticed the other day that all the, the needles have turned brown. A lot of the needles have turned brown. Mm. Are they going to come back next year? The, obviously, mm. I hadn't watered it enough, obviously, so mm-hmm. it got... Uh, that it's blue spruce, a, that's a globe blue spruce you got there, and, and it shouldn't need a heck of a lot of water. Yeah, it's not a water issue, I don't think. Yeah. Really? Oh, wow. Um, so why do I, is it because of the sun that those needles, and it's kind of mm-hmm. more on the inside, and it's more the afternoon mm-hmm. sun side mm-hmm. that it's uh, really, they've turned brown and gray, and are they going to come back next year? Well, the needles aren't going to come back, but the new growth will come, hopefully, and mm-hmm. overcome and, and hide all that brown on the inside. You might want to cut a piece off and pop by with it sometime, Addy, and just let me have a look at it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The other thing, soil from pots. You know, the, the mm-hmm. you get pots in there at a mm-hmm. nursery with yep. soil plants in it. When you dump it the next year, it's very, it's full of um, full of roots, and it's also very light. Should you be amending it with a dark garden soil to, or just throwing it back in the garden? Well, it just depends on what you're you're using it for what I use mine for because I've got a big bin of it. I don't throw any of it out. I work it into the vegetable garden. I also use it for planting large plants. I, I, I use it uh, as a potting soil. So, that, Yeah, that's what I've been doing mm-hmm. too. I, I haven't thrown it out, but yeah. I just noticed like, I've got a big container of it yeah. now. But it's, it's very light. It's yeah. not a rich-looking soil. Does it have any nutrients in it? Well, it it well, it quite often they're leached out. But uh, on the other hand, it's what potting soil is, Addie. It's it's an open, loose mix, so that there's lots of air in there. And so when you've got that uh, leftover potting soil in that, you can reuse it as a potting soil. But you'll have to feed because it's probably leached out the, the nutrients, or use it uh, like you've been doing as a soil amendment. Just like you add peat moss or something to the garden, you can use that potting soil to work into your garden bed to loosen it up. Yeah, that's what I've been doing. Mm-hmm. I'm just running short of garden beds to throw it here to, and I don't yeah. throw it. Well, if you, you know, you can, if, you, uh, you can, you can use it as a potting soil as well. Just as a potting yeah. soil, and it'll mm-hmm. okay, but you have to fertilize it more. Yeah, uh, you, yeah. Just yeah, like anything else. Yeah. All yeah. potting soils you have to feed like that. Mm-hmm. So I, I don't think the only difference is really is that when you get old soil, there's some risk that you might have a bit of a disease that might be in there, and, and yeah. but you know. 
I still think it's fine just yeah, to use I, it as I, is. I don't use it for planting seeds or cuttings and things yeah. like that. You use the new stuff. For mature but plants. Mature plants, when you're repotting and stuff out mm-hmm. in the garden, you're Berg fine. Bergmanzias, yep. for yep, example. Yep. They love it. Oh, yep. oh, okay. So I can use that soil again. Yeah. Is bet. it time to transplant or yeah, is it time to transplant my Christmas cactus? I've got two pots and they're getting a little bit too big for the two pots. So can I put both of them in one pot? And is it time to do it now? I don't think it would hurt to do it now. Yeah. Our favorite time is February, uh, March. March yeah. yeah, but you could still do it now. Yep. They're they're pretty adaptable. You know, they love the love moisture, as you know, in the summertime. So yeah, just, well, they uh, just finished. They just finished. But one of them just finished blooming. I, oh I my goodness! They blooms as it as it is <laughs> That's amazing. Well, uh, yeah, you've done well. They they uh, they usually don't bloom much in the summertime. And you really want them to pick up in the fall. You know, once it starts cooling off in the evenings, then probably mid-September, bring them back in the house. Are yours in the house or are they out of the house? No, mine are. I put mine out the minute that there was no fear of frost. I put them out and uh, along with my cactus plants, and uh, all of them are really doing quite well. Mm-hmm. The one, one didn't bloom. It had buds, but they, the buds fell off. Now, I don't know why, mm-hmm. but the other one was just like, I couldn't believe it. It was Christmas in July. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Perfect. That's very cool. Okay. Love it. Thanks a lot, guys. You have a great week. Yeah, you too, Addy. We appreciate your call. Take care. Thanks for calling. Bye bye. And uh, after Addy, we've got Tony. Thanks for joining us, Tony. Hi, guys. Hello. Uh, I got a bit of a mystery here. Mm-hmm. I got some um, Romano beans. They're uh, pole climbers. Mm-hmm. Anyway, we had that heat wave. It took a bit of a toll. Some of the leaves just dried right up and crumbled and so on. Now, in the last week or so, they came back nicely. They're climbing like crazy. Mm-hmm. Some are like 8 feet plus 10 feet. But no flowers. I, I got mm-hmm. no flowers at all. And I got six poles, really healthy now, climbing and lots of leaves and so on, but no flowers. So yeah. I hope I get some beans. These are like a... My mom brought them back way back when from Italy, and I've been mm. saving seeds ever since. Yeah. And uh, last year, they sort of they they didn't flower so late, and then they got a little bit of beans, and this year nothing. So yeah. uh, kind they, of worried there. <laughs> yeah, they will. I think that now we're getting this. Uh, you know, it's all about cooler weather. You know, when it yeah. cools off, that's what really gets them starting to bloom. And so one year, I remember we didn't get. We didn't have any beans on our plants until it right into August, and then all of a sudden they just went nuts and they burst oh, okay. into bloom. We got all our our beans in the fall, which was really. So you think it's heat, eh? It's from the from the heat. Yes, yeah. They don't like blooming when it's too hot. So sometimes we'll get some early beans, and then when it gets hot, they pause, you know, and then they slow down. And then all of a sudden, mine are actually starting to really kick in right now, and they're starting to bloom and produce uh, new beans. Uh, right, so right. just this last uh, few days of cool temperatures has really helped. So hopefully, you know, that sustains and we get some more cool weather. We get some get some beans right. going. So now uh, I guess for if I do get some beans for next year, should I maybe plant them earlier? So uh, try to prevent this uh, the bit of heat wave? I don't, know, what? <laughs> I don't think there's much you can really do, you know, about the weather. But yeah. you know what we did this year that was really great was uh, we we bought six pack uh, tray inserts you know and we put them in a tray just like you'd buy a six pack of animals right, right. fill them with soil and we put our beans all in those planted mm-hmm. them indoors I think we planted them around the beginning of uh, May I think it was yeah uh, somewhere on the end of April and oh my God they shot up about six inches tall great big leaves on them and when we put put those outside. About the middle of May, they just did not look back. They were beautiful, and they just grew like okay, crazy. So that's an idea, yeah. Yeah, I, I planted mine in the, well, about the first week of May, and it took a long time to come up, about yeah. these three weeks or so. And, yeah. Uh, so uh, do them indoors. All right. So you think that's uh, hopefully I get some beans in it? It's it's kind of a normal. Well, thing I think in the fall me. you're gonna you're gonna have a, a crop. I'm sure you will, Tony. It it kind of has to happen. Mm-hmm. All right. Very good. Okay. Thanks, guys. Destin. All right. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Tony. And uh, on that note, we're going to take our final break of the day. Uh, We invite your calls, 250-862-2525. And Ken and I will be back with more AM 1150 Garden Show. Ken, we've uh, got a gal out there, Michelle. She's wondering about her cosmos. It's, uh, Mm -hmm. it's, uh, 
six feet, five, five feet tall and an inch in diameter trunk on it, a stem, and it's not blooming. So mm-hmm. right away you said, it's too happy. It's too happy. Too happy. Too much nitrogen and not enough phosphorus. So we're suggesting you stir in some superphosphate, 0440. Stir that into the ground, and that's not only going to help maybe this year. Uh, it probably won't be big for this year, but next year it's going to help that ground produce blossoms instead of uh, tops. It's too much nitrogen in there. And if you want to uh, help, uh, I mentioned before this product, 105210 or 106010. There's a couple of them on the market. Very high middle number and low nitrogen, and that will help stimulate some blossoms as well. So mm-hmm. hopefully that's helped you, uh, Michelle, uh, get on the road to recovery there and get that cosmos blooming. Uh, you can pretty well guarantee it will eventually bloom, I suppose, yeah. um, in the fall. And as the weather moderates a bit, uh, mm-hmm. you should get some great, great fall color. Yeah, some of the cosmos are, not, are just sort of getting going right now. So I think by the time we're in August, you should be seeing some good color on that. Yeah. It just uh, It's just like too happy. Too just excited. Too excited, too happy. Yeah. It's happy to be alive, and it's just going nuts for you. But, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. 250-862-2525. We've got a little bit of time left here for a call or two, and we always enjoy hearing from you as we uh, do this every Saturday morning and enjoy every minute of it. Um, again, the topic of conversation uh, right now is water and the lack thereof mm-hmm. and how we must be very, very careful about how much water we use uh, it, as a group of us, and so that we, and and uh, don't end up <laughs> with no water. I mean, mm-hmm. that's that would be a drag. The old, yeah. yeah, you can't really survive without it. And uh, you know, I think our society is uh, are typically fairly heavy water users, mm-hmm. and we we like our grasses to be our lawns to be green, and um, you know. Having a, having a bit of a brown lawn is not a bad thing. It's and grass. When you see your lawns going brown, that's just they just go dormant. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially the Kentucky blue grass tends to just go brown. Yeah. It'll shut down if it gets too dry, and then it comes back. But it takes about four weeks or so. Yep. Yeah. Okay, Ken. We've got Nick joining us. Good morning, Nick. Good morning, Don. Good morning. Nice to talk to you, Nick. You know. I can hardly hear you. Well, I'm, tr- I'm speaking into the microphone here like I mean, mean it. Okay. Yeah, now you're okay. <laughs> uh, Don, I was thinking of, in the earlier times, we had all these ginseng covers mm-hmm. in Kamloops and Cash Creek. Yes. I wonder if they probably should reinvest that sort of thing and start growing fruit crops underneath. Hmm. Uh, you're talking about the, the, the ginseng covering there. They, they, they grow the ginseng in the shade, right? Yeah, that's right. Asian so you're wondering what you can grow under it uh, other than ginseng. Oh, you can grow just about anything on there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And as a matter of fact, like uh, what you're saying is that that would have been a good uh, combat for the heat, right? That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. About 80% yeah. shade. Right. And it makes it easier to harvest for mm-hmm. people to work under and also for the fruit itself. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nick, what happened to the ginseng thing, just out of interest's sake? What happened to that? Because, I mean, it, it was a big the deal. The market into... fell out of the bottom. The bottom fell out of it. Out of it. Mm-hmm. And what's the reason for that? Well, the market is shipping it out to Hong Kong, and then they, uh, they sent uh, couriers down into China from Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. And okay. the couriers didn't come back with the money. Ah, because I know there was a show on television about ginseng, and there was wars going over it, like battles out in the bush. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a big deal. It used but, to be about $50 a pound. Yeah, yeah. And it dropped down to about 10 I I laughed. My, my, uh, my son one time, he, he's always looking for something to do, and uh, he was suggesting we plant the whole yard out in saffron crocuses. <laughs> he, said, they're so, he says, it's really worth a lot of money, Dad, more than gold. And I said, well, yeah. you got to grow a lot of saffron, Joe. <laughs> That's right. That's a lot he, of hard work. In but it. he had an idea. <laughs> yeah. That's right. So, Nick, when are we going to get together and have a coffee? I'm not too sure. I'm going to stay in the shade for now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there you go. Well, maybe this fall we'll get together. I'll have to. Okay. Yes, give me a call. I'm in the book. Give me a call, and we'll set something up. I'd love to talk to you. Okay. 
Thanks for okay, buddy. Talk. Take Thanks, care. Nick. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye. 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 Yeah, that's Nick. He used to have Karen's Florist in town. Yeah. We've we're, yeah. we're been friends for many, many years, and I'd love to sit down and have a chin wag. That's what I like doing, chin wagging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Well, lots to talk about, that's for sure. We'll have, a lot, of, we'll have a lot of chin wagging going on tomorrow uh, mm-hmm. in the garden. <laughs> yeah. I'm looking forward to it. It's going to be fun. And another shout-out, of course, to Wendy and Alan Reed. They're not quite ready to roll yet, but, boy, they do a great job with apples and pears and juice and everything. Oh, yeah, do they ever. They are a uh, a real pioneer family in Kelowna, pioneer. Just on Burn. They're on Burn, right? Burns Road. Burns Road. Burns Road, yeah. I hate to call myself a pioneer, you know, like Father Pandozi was a pioneer. Yeah, Yeah, you're not a pioneer. Born in 1950. But uh, yeah. <laughs> there are, in my family, I mean, my, my folks came here in 1922. Yeah. Your grandfather. Grandfather came yeah. in 1922 with my dad and, and my aunt. Mm-hmm. And uh, mom's family, the Hendersons, came in uh, 1937, I think it was, 1937. Yeah, we were just talking, I was talking with someone there the other day um, uh, about how your family started mm-hmm. out. And, and remember the old truck and it said, uh, you know, mm-hmm. established 1922, which yeah. was pretty cool. And yeah. then we used to do those, all the floats, yeah. you know, for the parades <laughs> and stuff. What a fun. Like, is that, uh, no parades anymore, I guess. Is that, are they? Well, the regatta parade, of course, uh, that was, the, the regatta was held every year. And mm-hmm. uh, then it was now pretty much petered out. It was a big event in Kelowna. And when yeah. you think, when you think about, one of the things about the water issue we talk about, um, there's just so much more people using the water, and that's mm-hmm. just, that's just one of the big deals. That's a big pressure point there. Uh, whereas when I was born, there was ten thousand people here. Right. When I was a teenager in the f- mid fifth mid sixties, people would say, "Well, how many people live in Kelowna?" I said, "Well, around f- sixteen to twenty thousand mm-hmm. people in in the mid sixties." Mm-hmm. And then, of course, it just mushroomed, and and now it's exponential. It's just people are moving here like crazy. So the water is a huge issue. There's mm-hmm. a lot of folks working on that issue, but we have to, as individuals, work on it as well and be cognizant of it because uh, it's it's this year is really showing its ugly head uh, with the lake l- levels very low and mm-hmm. with the fact that we didn't get much snow this winter. So yep. let's all do a rain dance. Uh, we want to do a rain dance. Mm-hmm. When I go home, I will be doing that. And of course, you remain clothed for the rain dance. Oh, you know? okay. Yeah, yeah, I always yeah. thought you had to be, uh, uh, you know. No, that was that was naked gardening day in May. Oh, yeah. right, right, mm-hmm. right. Yeah, I always get them mixed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, here we are. We're right close to mm-hmm. uh, getting getting finished for today, uh, Ken. I just want to mention too uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is uh, important to mention, and that is the uh, Okanagan uh, gardeners. Uh, Master Gardener's basic training course has been postponed this year. Again, mostly due to COVID concerns and uh, various other uh, issues, but uh, it'll be back on board uh, Mm -hmm. next year, I'm sure. Just like a lot of things, they will be back on board. The Master Gardener's, uh, uh, Okanagan Master Gardener's are sort of affiliated with, with, uh, well, the BC Master Gardener's and all the Pacific Northwest master gardeners. There's mm-hmm. lots. And a master gardener is basically somebody who's just a regular person, regular gardener that likes gardening and whatnot. To taking that expert, that level of, of knowledge to a different level, taking it up there. And I often call them their black belt gardeners. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. yeah. And you've spoken many times and, mm-hmm. and taught many times, many classes at the master gardeners, as have I. And uh, I really admire the program. And I think it's... Uh, there's a lot to be said when somebody gets that master gardener's ticket. They are truly a black belt gardener. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to take that, uh, do the tips and plants of the week, and then we're out of here, Ken. Um, you betcha. My tip of the week, as I've said this before, however, I'll say it again, the best investment in the garden is a comfortable, well-placed garden bench where you can go mm. sit. Mm-hmm. My plant of the week is the great trumpet vine, the Campsus radicans. Some people call it the hummingbird vine because it does attract hummingbirds like crazy. Oh, yeah, for sure. It's a beautiful, beautiful vine. That's my plant of the week. All right, I also have a tip and a plant this week, and my tip of the week is that the beans are back. We've had a lot of talk about beans today, and it's really the little bit of cooler weather that we're waiting for has arrived, and we're starting to see little beans arriving and showing up 
just after the flowers and uh, weren't getting any there for a while and but now they're back on track all right dan my plant of the week this week is the phlox david i it's one of the best garden perennials this is a summer phlox a phlox paniculata and this one is pure white and it really is one of the best it's disease resistant and it's deer resistant and just a great plant drought tolerant as well all right, that's my tips and plants. Remember to check growercoach.com. There you go, Ken. Mm-hmm. And again, my uh, thoughts and condolences go out to the Scotter family. A uh, real giant in the horticultural industry, mm-hmm. and not in the industry, but in the horticultural circles, George Scotter has passed away. And also, Lars Pata, my math teacher, physics mm-hmm. teacher. He was a giant of a guy, too, in his own right. And my, our thoughts and prayers go out to, uh, to the Pata family. Um, my Shigo moment and the Shigo moment, of course, involves Alex Shigo, Dr. Alex Shigo. Ken and I had the honor of meeting Dr. Shigo Mm -hmm. and watching him speak in Victoria when we were there in that conference. His Shigo, the Shigo quote of the week is boredom is a major cause of accidents. Robotic people get bored easily. Thinking people seldom get bored. So keep thinking, Ken. I'm thinking. (laughs) You betcha. There you go. Okay. That's a good one, Alex. Thank yep. you. And on that note, we're going to say goodbye, and we will see you next week with more AM 1150 Garden Show.